Good morning. It is good to be with you each and every one this day, wherever you may be. Today is Sunday, the 10th of January. And by anyone's estimation, this has been a challenging week for us as a people, as a nation, as Christians, as people. And truth be told, I've thought many times over the last day or so of the need to just scrap everything I've prepared for this service and sermon and start anew to be more on point. And then I, I reviewed the texts and my notes, and it is my deep and earnest prayer that they are indeed on point given the protests, the riot, the challenges that face us as a people. So my request is simple, and it's really not any different than any other day, but especially poignant on this Sunday, that we enter this time, this sacred space, to hear God's word read and spoken with an open ear, and an open mind and an open heart to all that's happened, that we do not set current events aside, but have them be a part of how we respond, how we hear, and how we listen. So let us pray. O God of peace, you call us to be your agents of mercy, your strong witnesses of compassion and kindness. Help us to be good listeners. Help us to be good proclaimers of inclusion so that as we travel these, these days together, we may do so. We may do so upheld by the strength of your guiding hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So once again, our passages for today, I hope you've taken the time to read them on our online service or pause the tape and read them on your own. Words from Paul, the church at Colossae, and also the primary passage for today from Ezekiel. But I wish to begin with what we experienced just a moment ago. The lyrics to that beautiful, beautiful hymn. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God until my heart is pure, until with thee I will one will to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, until this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. Breathe on me, breath of God, so shall I never die, but will live the perfect life of thine eternity. Such powerful, beautiful, wonderful lyrics to our closing hymn for today. Breathe on me, breath of God. They grab a hold of our hearts, don't they? They beckon us, they stir us, they speak of a deep, deep abiding desire to ever be close to God, to breathe in that relationship into our whole being. It's the most obvious thing in all the world for a Christian to say, about what we want, about what we need, about 
what we would like to happen each and every day, each and every new year, to draw closer in our relationship with God, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Until that earthly part of me glows with that fire divine. I know, we know, you know from time immemorial that so very often our New Year's resolutions are made up of less worthy stuff. Dieting a little bit more, exercising a little bit more, watching a little bit less TV. All good things, but not really quite on the same par, is it? Are they? With this powerful hymn. All of our music, in fact, for today are selections that focus in on the work of the Spirit. Not that this Sunday is Pentecost. That won't happen until late May. But because of the work of the Spirit is to move us into deeper, richer, closer, nearer relationships with God. Breathe on me, breath of God's Spirit, Spirit of gentleness. Fall afresh on me, all great hymns for today. Traditionally, this Sunday, the Sunday immediately following Epiphany is reserved for texts and sermons all about the baptism of Jesus. It's a day that's all about holy visitation, about naming and claiming, about rushing waters that cleanse and drawing closer to God. I've chosen different passages bypassing baptism, but still looking at such themes through the lens of water and of how the Spirit moves and where the Spirit is leading. So let's think about it from our primary passage, the Old Testament story. In Ezekiel's vision, recounted In our text for today, the land itself is nourished by a stream that flows directly out of the temple. And as Ezekiel walked along the banks of that stream, he was directed at different points in time to step into the water. to step into the water and ascertain its depth. At one point, it was ankle deep. At another, he was knee deep. He followed the stream a little bit further, and now it was more like a river. And when he stepped in, he was waist deep. And then later on, when he stepped in just a bit further downstream, he discovered that the water was most definitely a river now so deep that he could not stand nor cross it on foot. All of this, all of this begs the most obvious of questions. God is asking, how deep is our faith? Is it ankle deep? Providing us for the chance of feeling and knowing and experiencing something as we step in, put a toe in the water, but also having the opportunity to jump right back out again and back on dry land. And even though walking in ankle-deep water, we've all experienced this while on vacation near the ocean when the sun is shining and the seagulls are everywhere, all of that seems like such a paradise, Ezekiel quickly learns that something so much more is about to happen. 
And so God asks us to follow our foremothers and our forefathers in the faith and wade in, wade into this thing called faith a little bit deeper. Draw closer to God and be at knee depth. Think back to the last time when you stood in some water and you felt the current. At this level, you're still in control, but there's some adjustments here or there that need to be made so that you can keep your footing and still move forward. You can easily rush back to the shoreline, but we also begin to know, we begin to feel how wonderfully refreshing that water is at knee depth. Again, Ezekiel is directed further downstream and told to step into the water. This time it's waist deep. Maybe you remember the last time you were in a swimming pool. At first, my goodness, the water's so cold and bracing. It jolts the system and makes you wonder if it just wouldn't be better to be back on that chaise lounge and enjoying the sunshine. And then a moment passes and you start to settle in. You adjust and grow more comfortable and what was just a moment ago, water that felt like a cold slap, now feels so inviting. And as you get used to it all, you start to let your arms float on top of the water. You may even begin to risk a splash here or there. Now that we're waist deep, there's a certain buoyancy that the water offers. We're lighter, and the water is actually holding us up. And before you know it, there's almost an uncontrollable urge to dive headfirst and experience more. The trouble, of course is that being waist deep in water really means that you can't go anywhere very fast or as quickly as you'd like. Everything takes a great deal of effort. Now your body, mind, and soul have to work not only in unison with each other, but with the water itself if you want to stay afloat, if you want to move forward. Sometimes the calculation is done over such an effort so very quickly that we decide that it's just better to move back. Knee depth, ankle depth, maybe even on the shore. It's just easier to stand, maybe, where there's less resistance. And yet we know that God is always asking us to go deeper now more than ever we are being asked to go deeper God asks us to step into the water God walks with us in the water and most importantly, God has something so very remarkable to show us as we travel further, closer, nearer with God through these waters of life. In a very real and certain sense, especially as we enter this new year together with an entire ocean, right? of opportunity and challenge. We are really, we are really, truly just being asked one very simple question. 
Are you satisfied with where you stand in your relationship with God? Ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep. Are you ready to dive in further, deeper, closer, nearer? Now, for what God wanted to show Ezekiel, and of course, each and every one of us, when he stepped out further into what was once a stream but now a river, the Spirit of God asked Ezekiel to swim and to look to venture out into the waters of life, to feel that buoyancy of God's hand holding him up, the Spirit's loving embrace through troubled and turbulent waters. It really is good news God is offering, this opportunity to participate in life. To be held up as we travel together. But of course, in this story, in the whole story of our lives and of Scripture, there's always more. Not only is our faith asked to move beyond the convenience of shallow waters, we're asked to go deep enough in order to swim. Why? So that we can see what God sees. What God wants us to see. That this little river that was once just a stream now rushes and flows and most importantly brings life for everyone and everything, for all of creation, trees and farmland, fish and wildlife, all are nurtured by its waters, receiving life in its fullest form. And ours is to jump in. When the Apostle Paul wrote to that fledgling congregation in Colossae, he didn't use the imagery of water and swimming. In fact, he spoke about putting clothes on. But the principle is still the same. Let the peace of Christ dwell in you richly. And whatever you do in everything, you do and say, let it be done in the name of Christ Jesus, and be thankful. 2020 brought so many challenges and struggles, and so will 2021. These are turbulent and troubled waters. But we swim with Jesus. We have the buoyancy of the Holy Spirit to hold us up. And there is life abundant all around us. Ours is to embrace those good, great gifts that Paul instructed the people of the early church to live out so that as we swim, we may do so as people of compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and love. Gifts, gifts the world needs now more than ever, don't you think? And so let us swim together 
in Christ's name. Amen.